we had salt flats on, per, on surface. Uh, and importantly, the result uh, was 918 milligrams per liter. So very strong result, uh, one that would rival, I think, uh, anybody that would be operating in, in LATAM or otherwise. Um, and we are extremely excited by uh, uh, this result. Hello and welcome to viewers tuning in to Assay TV. In this session, I'm joining Ion Energy, who are the first company exploring and developing Mongolia's lithium solars. And I'm pleased to be speaking with Ali Haji, CEO and director of the company. Hello again, Ali. Adam, good to be here as always. Yeah, so last time we spoke, we got a good update of your projects, but more recently there's been an actual brine discovery at Ugak Naran. Um, could you talk us through the, the lithium project there and, and the discovery itself as well? Of course. I, I think it's important for our, our viewers to, to note that uh, you know, we operate in Mongolia. Uh, we are first movers in Mongolia, which means we don't have the necessary skill set in Mongolia to advance our projects, much like you would have seen in LATAM. Right. Uh, you know, the, the lithium triangle, for instance, you know, talks about the uh, the rally as far as their equity is concerned. Um, and for us, for Ion Energy, uh, we have to take a more responsible approach. We have to ensure that we're using shareholder capital in the best way possible. And the way to do that is to ensure that we have industry experts alongside us when we visit site. And so uh, you, you, you rightly pointed out that we'd have uh, a brine discovery, but a bit of background around that. Uh, in February, we had uh, an opportunity to get out to uh, uh, or, or rather have conversations, I beg your pardon, have, have conversations with our, our technical team at country. Uh, we started planning for a site visit uh, in March and April. Uh, we then had uh, a number of polls planned on our Rogat Naran asset, uh, as well as some TEM geophysics that we would uh, undertake when we, war, when we were in country. And uh, for the folks uh, that are new to the story, um, Ion Energy, of course, is a lithium brine explorer in Mongolia, as Adam rightly pointed out. Uh, but importantly, I think uh, we've added some very strong names from a technical perspective. So uh, Don Haynes is my chief technical advisor. He's an individual that's worked on lithium assets around the world. Uh, he knows both the brine and the hard rock space very well. In fact, he sits on the OSC committee uh, for lithium companies before they're allowed to go public so that they, they get to validate what a 43101 truly is before they're allowed to go public. He's been to Mongolia a number of times. He's been to China and he's seen the Qinghai Giants, which are about 1,500 kilometers away from us. Uh, and beyond that, uh, we also took Dr. Mark King with us. Uh, and Dr. Mark King was the qualified person on file at Neolithium uh, when they sold to Zijin. He was also the qualified person that wrote the very first few 43-101s on Lithium Americas. So we designed a program that ensured that we're getting uh, a good sense of our, our, our basin. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised having gone out there after a two and a half year hiatus. You know, the vast majority of the Google videos that you or Google uh, satellite photos that you see uh, are taken during the two weeks of rainfall in country. And so it did not appear to be a solar. And Adam, I'm sure you'll overlay some of the images with respect to what uh, the salt flats look like. And so when we were out there, we were able to, to not only see the, um, uh, the auger rigs in, 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 in action, uh, drilling, uh, we had a 25-man exploration camp on site uh, that we spent a fair bit of time in. Uh, we also had the ability to see the geophysics team in action and, and determine what work they were doing. So they ultimately sent the data over to Zonge in the US. Um, they're currently evaluating that. Uh, but importantly, to highlight you know, what you just uh, essentially asked me, Adam, is um, the brine discovery. And uh, if you look historically at uh, a number of uh, lithium brine projects in, in LATAM or uh, or otherwise that were, were essentially started off of uh, uh, what, what can be said to be a Coke bottle sample. <laughs> so you're essentially picking up the brine on surface uh, in a bottle, you're then assaying it for the hydrometer readings as well as the ultimate uh, uh, chemical composition. And uh, we had natural evaporation ponds on surface, we had salt flats on, per on surface, uh, and importantly, the result uh, was 918 milligrams per liter. So very strong result. Uh, one that would rival, I think, uh, anybody that would be operating in, in LATAM or otherwise. Um, and we are extremely excited by, by uh, uh, this result and, and also seeing, uh, in fact, that uh, the basin at Urgaf Naran, uh, with a 29,000 hectare license, uh, the basin covers around 17,000 hectares. So uh, very promising early days. Uh, we will have some more news flow coming into PDAC, which starts in Toronto next week. Uh, but we're extremely keen to, to, to get that out to market uh, on Baba Yol. 
Uh, we're also planning some some additional exploration programs there, which will be announced alongside uh, the Ugaf Marin uh, expansion. So, very excited as a company. Yeah, fantastic, excellent context there, and very exciting times um, with the, with the samples. Just to delve into that a little bit more specifically, are you waiting on any more uh, sampling to come back from the Coke bottle sort of surface stage? Or have you covered a, enough of the areas that that, that you want to? And then also, what's the next phase? How are you going to um, extend this to a deeper level? Fantastic question. So we, we did only collect one brine sample on surface. Uh, we did collect some some sort of, uh, you can call them rock chips or sediment chips, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, on surface that were acid as well. Those were obviously fast-tracked because it is just you know like a handful or, or less than that, actually, three samples. Uh, so we received that 918 milligrams per liter. We drilled 72 holes using proper hydrogeological sampling methods, which is you drill down, in our case, down to 12 meters. Uh, if you hit the water table, you drill two more meters. If you hit basement, you stop. You wait 24 hours, you bail out the hole at least twice, and then come back to the hole to measure the, the brine samples or collect the brine samples for measurement. Uh, so those have been submitted to lab. Uh, you know, you look at surface, you look at um, 918 on the, uh, literally on surface, and then um, whatever you find below that uh, is indicative of, of what's happening in, in sort of that, that drainage basin. Uh, but more importantly for us, the geophysics that we've currently completed, uh, over 88 line kilometers, uh, will allow us to determine the depth of that basin. So we're currently designing where the monitoring wells will go down um, in uh, the Urgaknaran Basin. And as far as Bob Iol is concerned, uh, much the same. So we, we received some results, which I think we've shown to market. We showed them we had the 1502 ppm white wolf prospect. Uh, that was a drilling program that was only down to six liters uh, using an auger rig that allowed us to scratch the surface. Uh, but now we can plan a more extensive program given we've trained people in country uh, to be able to explore for lithium brine. So lots to come from us, a very busy summer. Um, obviously, PIDAC is, is, uh, is around the corner here and we'll be presenting on Monday on uh, Mongolia Day alongside the Mongolian delegation. Uh, we're hosting a number of ministers and, and uh, government delegates. And then on Tuesday, we'll be having our own cocktails. So we will be on the floor at PIDAC. Uh, everybody that is watching this video is welcome to pop by uh, with any questions that they may have, uh, any ad hoc meetings, what have you, happy to have those as well. So. A uh, lot of work this summer, a uh, lot of extensive sort of um, better, uh, uh, a lot of work this summer to allow us to better understand our assets. Um, and so stay tuned. We have a, a lot of catching up to do as far as our equity price relative to our peers. And uh, now that we have access to country and we've built a world uh, class team, um, stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just a question quickly uh, around sort of the situational play and the long-term strategy. You know, you're very well positioned close to China being the leader of battery manufacturing, I suppose. Um, that's an advantage there. But what can you talk about um, in terms of your uh, relationships with the Chinese battery sector? Um, and then uh, also um, the lithium market at this current point as well, uh, just for viewers who would be interested. We hear from analysts and we hear from investors, but it'd be great to get your view as a corporate CEO around um, how strategically important um, the lithium play can be in the moment. Of course, valid question. I think, uh, you know, that's something that uh, most people skirt around. They don't really talk about it all that much. Um, with respect to our proximity to the largest consumer that you rightly pointed out, uh, China today consumes 53% of the world's lithium. They refine, you know, in excess of 75% of the world's lithium, produce about 80% of the batteries that go into uh, vehicles worldwide. Uh, and folks tend to forget, you know, we, you have BYD, you have Geely, uh, you have a number of manufacturers in China uh, that produce far more vehicles than Tesla, uh, which is a, a household name in, in, in the Western world. Uh, but uh, as you know, Tesla has some facilities in China as well. So our proximity to that massive market is obviously of importance, and uh, we continue to uh, 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 realize that. But I think more importantly, when, when we look at this clean green energy revolution, uh, you know, we talk about it as being clean and green, uh, meaning you're essentially offsetting your carbon uh, footprint. Uh, when you're shipping uh, lithium concentrates or, or carbonate equivalent from uh, LATAM, 15,000 largest consumer, mm -hmm. uh, 
that's quite the carbon footprint. Uh, and I think Bloomberg today put an article out uh, with respect to what the true cost is of uh, this clean green energy revolution and is it truly green? Um, so I think for us, when we look at it from, from, from an environmental footprint perspective, uh, being essentially on the doorstep of the largest consumer, that allows us to offset a lot of the carbon that is being produced in order to, to, to ship this lithium from around the world over to China. Uh, and then beyond that, as far as the lithium market is concerned, um, you know, we know this is happening. We know countries such as Norway uh, have, have set targets as far as 2025 uh, with respect to full electrification of their, their, their transportation needs. Uh, but you have to recognize the fact that uh, lithium prices today are based on spot contracts. They're based on contracts that are off-take type agreements uh, between uh, sort of consumer and uh, producer. And so you're seeing a bit of consolidation in this space as far as Zijin uh, going out there and acquiring Neolithium. They just acquired another mine in Tibet. Um, you're seeing new players that have never really dwelled, dwelled in, uh, in the lithium space uh, sort of step in. You're seeing uh, manufacturers of vehicles uh, become miners or, or, or owners of mines. Uh, the price of lithium today at uh, between, you know, it, it changes day over day, but between 76 and, and, and as high as 80,000 uh, per LCE ton equivalent, uh, that is not sustainable in our view. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, if you had prices that high, you would ultimately reach a point where the equivalent of a Mini Cooper, for instance, uh, if that were to be fully electric, despite lithium only being 4% of the batteries, uh, the cost would be well in excess of 100,000 US per vehicle. Now, you can have governments around the world subsidize and print as much capital as, as you possibly can, uh, but with current cap, with cu current uh, inflation rates, uh, it's not a sustainable growth model. So you're seeing unconventional resources come online. You're seeing new discoveries being made in, in both the hard rock and the brine space. And, and this will help abate uh, some of the pricing that we're seeing today. Uh, and, you know, if, if we had an opportunity to have uh, lithium trade on, on an exchange such as the LME, uh, you know, let's not talk about nickel, but if it were to trade on the LME, uh, then you would have uh, some sort of control over, over the pricing there. So I think... We're in this spot now where um, supply is constrained and will continue to be so. Uh, the prices will have to come down as a result of new uh, production coming online as well. Uh, but uh, the, the macro side of the house, or, or sort of the, the uh, you know the, the regulatory side of the house, as far as uh, government mandates, um, pretty much ensures that we're moving towards this future, and lithium will continue to be uh, an, a, an element that is required. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very bright future ahead, but a challenge indeed to to bring these assets online. But you seem to be racing ahead with that, Ali. And, and, uh, Adam, sorry, I didn't forget to mention this, but uh, you, you asked about the strategics uh, and sort of who we're speaking with uh, with respect to potential partners. Yeah, indeed. Ion Energy is a company that we founded on the basis of uh, exploring um, and, and ultimately arriving at a resource indication for lithium assets in Mongolia. Uh, we've since, having uh, gone public on Babayol, 81,000 hectares, acquired Urbach Naran, another 29,000 hectares, so 110,000 hectares in total of highly prospective lithium presences. We've had some very strong results. We continue to look for additional assets in country uh, that we could acquire or partner with others uh, in order to advance. But importantly, um, you, you know, you look at it as a, an exploration story. It is not a production story. We've never said that we will bring these assets to production. We will always partner with the right people to ensure these assets come to production. So the University of Science and Technology in Mongolia, a big partner of ours that would ultimately benefit from you know, refining capacity or what have you. Uh, but beyond that, um, it's important to note that we do have NDAs in place with a number of Chinese uh, or Asian strategics. We also have an NDA in place with a European strategic. Uh, and last but not least, you know, flip it on, your, on its head, um, as oxymoronic as it may sound, it's, it's, it's a sign of consolidation. We have an NDA with a LATAM uh, lithium miner as well. So um, we do have those strategic conversations ongoing. We are fully funded companies. We're not looking for equity at this time. And that's important for our viewers to note. Uh, we'll continue to explore. We will continue to de-risk. And at the right time and at the right price, we will bring in uh, a strategic that allows us to advance our projects. Yeah, excellent. Uh, well, well, I'm glad you've uh, outlined that as well. That's a really strong position to be going into the PDAC with, and uh, I hope it's a very receptive audience and uh, meetings for you for you there next week. So uh, thanks, Ali, for the update. Um, really good to get the steer on where you're at with the exploration at Iron Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you.